well as a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, focusing on GU cancers, including prostate and testicular cancers. He has a medical degree from the University of Adelaide and completed a residency in internal medicine at Gunderson Lutheran uh, Medical Center with a fellowship uh, in hematology and oncology at Indiana University. Um, he has a number of peer-reviewed articles and also serves on the editorial board of JCO. Uh, he's, member of, he's a member of AACR, ECOG, and ASCO, where he serves on the Program and Cancer Committee. And his talk today will be a clinical perspective on surrogate endpoints in prostate cancer. Welcome, Chris. Before I start, let's get a feel for who's in the room. So who's a statistician in the room? Who is not a statistician? <laughs> what type of uh, backgrounds do we have? Biomedical engineering. Biomedical. Yeah, I'm bi medical engineering too. And a biochemist that is here in the front. And well, most of you are from the list seem to be from large and small biotech and interested in how to take your products further. Who's actually been involved in um, submission of IDs and design trials for the FDA reviews? And who realizes it's a very rigorous process? <laughs> and you still hear this, it's great. So, but even on the clinical trial side, how can we actually have a patient say, how can we design, have a question answered in a efficient, ma an efficient manner? That's the, one of the underlying dilemmas, and that's specifically true for prostate cancer. And I think it's a, a case example of where surrogacy work is dearly needed, and I haven't had the great opportunity of working with Thomas's team and uh, Mark Boyce through a collaboration that I will describe, where it brings together regulators, clinicians, medical oncologists, urologists, radiation oncologists, statisticians, um, partner, um, uh, patient advocacy groups, to actually address a very important problem. But it has to be done rigorously, and the work that Thomas will describe is being implemented into the work I'm going to describe. So first of all, so what are the learning objectives? Lisa from Search, um, so I followed my marching orders. What are the requirements for validating surrogate endpoints as currently used by the FDA? What are the steps entailed for surrogacy, surrogate validation? And what's the difference between patient level and trial level surrogacy? I won't go into the details of the statistics, but I'll go into the example of how you can use this and what the differences are. So drug approvals, it's actually not rocket science. You just have to show clinical benefit. And what is clinical benefit to get a drug approved? Improvement of survival with trials designed for a direct demonstration of all patients alone at the time you do the cap and life, you separate it. That's clear. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, depending on the indication, and therefore we're doing a lot of work in late stage disease, when it's the most resistant and you're hoping for a modest effect, but it's not really changing the cancer trajectory. And so some would say it's defeatist to be do doing drug development there, but the other side is pragmatic, that's how you can get a drug developed in the lifespan of a pap. So what about surrogacy? So you can also get a drug approved if you have a good surrogate, an improvement in inverted commas, like decreasing an event that actually tra tracks with improving overall survival, and that's what Thomas is going to describe. So yes, you can, your surrogate is, has to be validated if you're using it for overall survival. And we'll give an example of that. Now the other way to get a drug approved, you're probably familiar with, is improvement of cl clinical endpoints that reflect, reflect a better quality of life. They may not, ha you don't have to show they live longer, but you show they live better with the cancer in this case. M0 CRPC, the recent three drugs that were approved for patients that have a rise in PSA with nothing seen on a conventional CAT scan or bone scan. They were approved because they delayed the appearance of cancer. So those patients had some cancer, so there's cancer present, and those studies delayed the appearance of cancer on the scans. So it delayed, it delayed an asymptomatic event. The patients took drugs which had side effects, but it delayed an asymptomatic event. So it cost neutral. You delay something that's asymptomatic, but you're taking something that caused symptoms. So the drugs were approved just on delaying the event the asymptomatic event, they were delayed by causing a major delay in that event, but also had quality of life showing quality of life wasn't getting worse, possibly better by delaying the cancer progression symptoms. Later, this issue of RPFS2 delaying the, the second progression and overall survival of secondary endpoints. So it, 
they had not proved based on local survival benefits, but they're annotated by delaying the radiographic progression with secondary endpoints annotating it. But we're going to hone in on this aspect of, to get a drug approved. Yes, please. Can you explain uh, what's the difference between the surrogate or uh, placebo? I'll just, this, I'll go through that okay. as an example. So a surrogate here is, the, will, is an intermediate clinical endpoint. Okay. Something happens before the death event that you can impact that say, you, I'm gonna impact that event before the death event, and I impact that so much that this goes down. And this is the patient level and the trial level surrogacy that Thomas will describe, I think. Which one is the drug that you said was just approved on, uh, on that last slide? Uh, Enbalutamide, aflutamide, darolutamide. And these are for which type of cancer? Castration, sorry, CRPC, the flingo. Yeah. Castration resistant prostate cancer. Okay. But let's actually go through what is prostate cancer. You on the left is you have patients who have organ confined, low grade disease that may not need treatment. You can just watch it or treat it. Then you have within the box localized high risk disease where you may add hormones to radiation to decrease the risk of relapse or just do surgery alone because some of those patients have a risk of metastases. Then the PSA goes up, the patient may be put on hormones or maybe not. Then the cancer appears on the scan, we start androgen deprivation. And then after a period of time, the cancer grows with the rising PSA with a low testosterone. And what you can see is red up all the drugs we have approved in that space. Docetaxel, Bazitaxel, Avaratin, Alpharetin, Enzalutamide. And there are about, uh, no joke, probably more than 150 active trials in this late stage of castration resistant prostate cancer. But where we can potentially cure patients are in this setting here, preventing a relapse from localized disease. So this is the spectrum of prostate cancer. And again, the drug development is all there on the right, where the life expectancy is a couple of years, but we really want to be trying to basically cure the disease by preventing patients from relapsing from localized disease. But this time frame is measured in 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. So what is the evidence that actually improving the efficacy of local therapy for a man who has prostate cancer localized to the gland but at risk of relapse is this. Here we see in the United States, PSA and Australia, basically Western countries, the incidence went up with PSA testing, but also the mortality went down. So there was this issue of overdiagnosis, but we actually did decrease the mortality even though we found more cancer evidenced by the mortality curves going down over time. And this is what we found is that with the initial initiation of PSA screening slash testing, the blue bar, you can actually see the incidence of patients presenting with their first evidence of prostate cancer on a CAT scan or a bone scan went down with PSA testing. So we found the aggressive disease early when it was localized. Whereas that really wasn't the, isn't the case with breast cancer, with mammogram. And when we found these patients with high grade, high volume, but localized to the prostate, we radiated them, the red curve, some patients were cured, but we increased the number of patients who were cured by adding hormones, the blue curve, to the radiation, lowering their testosterone, because the testosterone is the fuel for the cancer, so giving the, all those body treatments, lowering their testosterone, also called castration, unfortunately, many or and adding the radiation, we cured more patients. So identifying high-risk disease, Curing the patient is really helpful, but look at this time frame. We're looking out at eight to ten years. And to conduct a trial during the life and still have a lifespan at the end of the patent, very difficult. This is the other adjuvant, major, major adjuvant study where you do surgery plus hormones versus just surgery alone. And this is a study of 100 patients, and again, it's measured in many years, decreased relapses, ultimately decreased decreased deaths from prostate cancers, but it took years. So what the big issue is, how many, how poor and how few studies we actually have done in the adjuvant space where we have the chance of actually curing prostate cancer. So let's actually take a step back and ask who actually dies from prostate cancer. So in the United States and Australia, there's about 160,000 in the US, 16,000 in Australia. Mortality about 26,000 in the UK, in in America, and about 3,000, 3,500 in Australia. And about 5% of the cases present de novo metastatic, the, the 
that all PSA screening, you still have patients who present with metastatic disease on the scan as their first diagnosis. Now, that leads the other two thirds to be those who actually relapse from high risk localized disease. So if we're going to decrease the death rate from prostate cancer and HRT, intensifying and curing more patients with high risk localized disease is where it's at. And I'll just give you the two extreme variants of prostate cancer. Yes, it's a problem, and why people say, well, we really don't need to do anything about it because the patients die with it, not from it. So here's an 80 year old man who's got diabetes, coronary artery disease, enlarged prostate, and Gleason 6 in one of 12 pools, so very little bit of cancer. We didn't need to know about that cancer. On the other side, and these are patients of mine, 48 years of age, 69, PSA 69, multiple bony metastases, he's put on hormones and chemotherapy cancer transformed to small cell, and he died. We want to prevent this one, this version of the prostate cancer. And we don't want to know this other one. So you hear a lot of people say, we don't, prostate cancer is overdiagnosed, over treat, and it depends on your perspective. So from a public policy, overdiagnosing, overfinding, overtreating, costs money and causes problems to the society. So people like say, we should be doing PSA screening. On the other side, the patients who have prostate cancer go, I wish I didn't have it, have you prevented it, doctor? How do I avoid the side effects of dying from it? Men without prostate cancer, can I avoid getting it? In the medical community, the GP, the radiation oncologist, the urologist, the medox, what is the best screening plan? What is the best treatment plan? Overtreating and overdiagnosis, patient uh, physicians can get paid from doing something that isn't needed. So there's huge conflicts in this conversation. So this led to decreased PSA testing. So the US Preventive Task Force said we're overdiagnosing, overtreating, we should do the PSA screening. And as you can see here, as you can see here, huge surge, and then um, incidents went down, and the incidents went down even further. One people were told not to do PSA testing by this task force. The, the primary care physicians weren't doing it. But actually, when we're doing less PSA screening, we're actually seeing the incidence of de novo metastatic disease going up because we're not identifying these high-risk, high-grade cancers that left untreated become metastatic. So we want to find them, don't we? And they're the patients who die of prostate cancer, and that's why we need to develop surrogates to accelerate the drug development in this space. So here's the notion. Preventative relapse after definitive local therapy is the most viable way in the near future to decrease the death rate of prostate cancer. I hope I've made that argument. And, but the question is, how do we do this in a timely manner? And again, this decrease in metastatic disease came with the PSA screening. However, a surgeon or a radiation oncologist have often said in the past, I'll just do my surgery, I want to do my radiation, I want to see if my intervention cured them without adding on the testosterone suppression castration. Not a good problem, not a good approach, because we know that the double therapy decreases the chances of, doesn't guarantee they need it, but it doesn't guarantee that they won't die the cancer. Some people needed it, some people didn't benefit from it, some didn't need it. But we know by chance you're more likely to be alive and not die of prostate cancer if you get the double therapy. So we need to fight this degree of nihilism from the radiation oncologists and surgeons at times. But let's put a patient on a clinical trial with meaning. So if we can decrease the, increase the intensity and efficacy of therapy, we'll actually decrease the death rate from prostate cancer. And if we decrease it by a third, we're talking about decreasing the death rate in Australia by 800 patients in the United States by 8,000 patients. That's a big public policy benefit. But also, these adjuvant trials take longer than a decade to complete. Too much time, money, resources, risk of obsolescence because the treatment may be outdated by the time you do this, and it's beyond the patent lifespan for new drugs. So we, this ISCAP working group, set a goal to develop an intermediate clinical endpoint which accurately reflects the improvement in overall survival cure rate. And it accelerates the conduct of adjuvant trials, so hopefully we can do it in a five to eight year time frame as opposed to a 10 to 15 year time frame. So we started in 2015 with support from Prostate Cancer Foundation and learned a lot from Thomas and his team. 
We needed individual patient data from all the randomized trials that were conducted in Canada, UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and the United States. The studies had to have been approved, completed, and terminated. We followed all the rules, the PRISMA statement of a systematic review and meta-analysis, all the searches you could possibly think of, and then aim to do a meta-analysis of randomized clinical data, individual patient data, having the granularity of each patient data actually adds so much power to this, so we can actually do what Thomas will describe, analysis at the patient level and the trial level. Well, what are the problems of finding an intermediate clinical endpoint in prostate cancer? It's a heterogeneous disease. Patients have a very variable outcome. There are heterogeneous treatments, surgery, radiation, with or without hormones, watching some patients. Some of these patients are old and may die of something else even though they have a really aggressive prostate cancer. The ADT, testosterone suppression, impacts the PSA, so there's a, round, a circular argument about trying to use an endpoint that actually is impacted by a therapy directly. So that's a problem. And we have no idea what density of data we would get. So this is what we did. We found, we have reviewed 129 trials, and then basically, after going through all of them, those that met criteria were about 102. Getting the actual data, we've got about 43 trials with 28,905 patients, and ultimately we got 22,000 patient data into the database. Some were suitable for one endpoint called disease-free survival, which was local relapse or metastatic relapse. And the other, but a small data set of 12,000 was only viable for the metastatic relapse. And we're going to focus on what we've shown as a surrogate for disease-free survival and also decreasing PSA relapses. Spoiler alert, I haven't published yet, but there is no surrogacy with those early endpoints. But with the, what I will show, we do have some surrogacy. Condition one and condition two is what Thomas is going to describe, but at a very high level, condition one is that the surrogate and the true endpoint must be correlated at the patient level. So if we decrease the metastatic event in the patient, does it mean that they were less likely to die of prostate cancer? At a trial level, you want to see that Yes, you decrease the rate of metastatic disease in the whole trial, and that also de associated with a decrease or improved overall survival in the whole trial. And the statistical characterization of that, I'm going to defer to Thomas. His name is all over this literature, and that's why. Push that one in. That's the kind of complicated stuff. So who did we get? Now, when you do these studies, you want to make sure you actually are representing the patients who get the disease and that go on trials. So most men were over the age, accrued after 1996. It's a relatively modern era. Most of the studies were radiation based because that's actually where they've done most of the studies. Very few, unfortunately we haven't been doing many studies in the surgical setting, but that's starting to change. Only 25% of the patients were less than 65, so most of the men are actually men who are 65 years and older. And the patients that went on the trials where we need the active therapy were mostly high risk and intermediate risk of relapse. So it's a relevant population who is at risk of dying of prostate cancer. And this is what we found. So this is very strong correlation. So much so it surprised a lot of people. So the association between the eight year oval survival and the five-year metastasis free survival was 0.83. So these are all the trials, and they pretty much go along that line there, so a very tight correlation. The second impact is at the trial level, and there was even stronger correlation. It decreased match and decreased deaths. And again, Thomas will describe that with his lecture next. Having been able to create that association, we know some patients who have metastases still die of something other than the prostate cancer, so it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Metastasis, death from prostate cancer. If that's the case, the surrogacy threshold effect would be 1.0. But recognizing that these patients who have these, and these metastases, some patients, not many, die of something else, and the STE, the surrogacy threshold effect, is 0.88. So that allows the, the um, linear regression analysis to be created where you can actually work
work out if I decrease a metastatic event by 40%, that is associated with a so hazard ratio for MFS of 0.6, decreasing metastasis by 40% is associated with decreasing death rate by 33%. Now, you can then model how long it takes to do a trial. And so here we have, so here we see if you accrued 2,000 patients and you're looking for an MFS benefit, you've actually got a lot of patients and you can actually use overall survival and really don't decrease the number of patients or decrease the time to getting the study readout when you're looking for an over survival benefit of 33, 29, or 25 percent, it has a ratio of over survival of those numbers. You do just as well when you're using the dotted curve overall survival. Now, however, if you use metastasis to survival and you're using about 700 patients, you can actually see if you have a metastasis free survival benefit of 40% hazard ratio of 0.6, you can actually get the trial done in under 10 years if you use that endpoint, but you're asking for a very big treatment effect. So if you're confident your drug has got a big treatment effect, you can actually substitute overall survival, which can take a lot longer to get to that endpoint. And this is what, how you can use the surrogacy to design trials, as an example. Have you taken Yep, this is all in fact, this is all encountered in that, absolutely. So by in having the patients who were on the trials, which were, your point is how relevant is this to the real world setting? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables. Correct, so, but that's both, those patients we took drove this. So those patients with all those variables, age, high grade disease, um, were actually put into the mix to come up with this surrogacy. So, Sensitivity analysis, yes, so the paper, this is all published in the JCO. Yeah. There are sensitivity analyses that show when you take these things out. Now, if this was a patient population dying of um, diagnosed and dying of prostate cancer in this time frame, and they were all in their 40s, this STE would be closer to 1.0. It's not 1.0 because of the fact of those variables that you're talking about. It took me a long time to understand this. I'm trying to explain it in 30 minutes, but yes. So you could potentially make it more, like, more effective more from a design perspective if you were to select for just a higher, higher risk disease. Younger, younger patients, basically. Or yeah, but then, 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 then again, that gets into is your treatment relevant to what's actually out there in the real world? So are you designing your study for the actual real world education? And that's a challenge. So, and I'll show you an example of enriching for what you're describing by enriching for high risk disease. Yeah. So in plain language, design trials, historically trials looking for a 25 to 30% decreased death rate from prostate cancer have taken 12 to 16 years to do. But that's a long time. Just think about where you were 12 years ago when you started to do this trial. I'm guessing some of you by age are probably still in high school. Just a thought. And if you don't take it as a compliment. If we are confident, I'm not sure about you, Thomas. I know where you were. If we are confident our new therapy is effective and can decrease the rate of metastases by 40% and have approved 1,000 patients in five years, you can get your readout in about eight years with a hazard ratio of 0 0.6 for an overall survival of 0 0.67. Here's an example of where this could have helped. Is it feasible? So patients who have arrived with PSA after their prostate got put on radiation or radiation plus hormones. And as you can see here, six years into the study, we saw there was actually a hazard ratio for MFS of 0.63. But no one believed or acted on the study until the overall survival readout happened 12 years later. So basically, this study was started in 1996 and was reported in 2017. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, two, no, 2001. That's 01, 2001. <coughs> read out in 2017, so 17 years. Whereas we could have actually been curing and decreasing the number of patients that have prostate cancer years earlier. 
And this is now a version of the standard of care for this patient population. This was a huge collaboration. One link there, so we talk about big data, we call this big ish data. So 25,000 patients, 50 data points per patient, so about a million data points of real clinical data, not pulling something out of a flat iron and trying to come up with something. This is real clinical trial data. And we had funding from Estellas Pharma, Medivation, Janssen, Pharmaceut, um, Millennium, Solio, and Sanofi. And it's testimony to data sharing, international collaboration. The other thing to think about is you take this forward, another aspect that we're doing with this project is what are the benefits to the patient and society for preventing a relapse, and preventing the morbidity of the treatment and the metastatic event? And what are the benefits to society for preventing the cost of therapy? If, so we can't show surrogacy between PSA relapse and death from prostate cancer. But wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to have a patient be on hormone treatments for 10, 15 years? So we're going to try and annotate the clinical benefit of preventing a PSA relapse at a health economic level. So there's surrogacy at <coughs> the organ survival level, but there are other ways of actually documenting the benefit of preventing an intermediate endpoint that has repercussions. How far do you see that study? So how long after? Yeah. Um, So the answer is, it's very variable. For super high-risk patients, about 15% of them will develop their metastases despite having been on the hormones by five years. And so, and that actually goes behind a trial design. So this is just showing all the trials in this space that could have potentially benefited from using metastasis-free survival. And these studies down here, Enterad and Atlas, the ones that I'm involved with, are Enterad and Design, and we're using the MFS endpoints. So we wrote it in 2013, hoping to have a readout in 2022, as opposed to 2028 and things like that. So it's an example of actually using this. And here's, an, to your point, we're doing the study of super high-risk patients, so those who have a 15% rate of the metastasis at five years, looking to see if we can decrease that rate to 9%, so it has a ratio of um, 0.6 in that patient population, but we're enriching for patients with super risk disease, regardless of age, whether they have radiation or surgery. And actually, by allowing patients to have had surgery, is somewhat enriching for younger patients. So, so this is a five year study? No, it's basically, so when you map it out, it's about seven to eight years. So, the time for accrual and the time for follow up and to have enough events. So, it's about eight years, as opposed to 12 and 16. But you, that's only if your drug has a major treatment effect. But it's also the payoff is big. And so that's why if you're going to do it, we have to do it early in the drug development for last battle. And so Janssen and, and Dilutamide have, uh, have been evaluated in this space. And not, that's why a lot of these studies are done by the investigator sponsored trial makers and the cooperative groups, hence why I've been doing and, and some and now our farmers are starting to look at doing studies in this space. But they have not historically been doing studies. So basically, this takes a lot of work to change paradigms, and we're up for it. So that's 30 minutes, and I'm here to take questions. So how are you detecting the metastatic cancer? Great point. What this gentleman is alluding to, there's a whole series of new imaging that's coming in. So that's the other thing we're doing with our with their partnership, is working on how do you ascertain the event, and right now, these events are based on conventional CAT scan and bone scan, but if you did a PSMA PET, you would actually find these cancers a lot earlier. So if patients do PSMA PET imaging, so it would not be a surrogate, I suspect, because that event is many years before the overall survival event. They could have, well have be an indolent and long response to the hormones and not die of the prostate cancer. These are ones that are basically, you can see on a less sensitive scan with a low testosterone. And so we have to do a whole other project to show if preventing a PSMA disease, feminine disease, with the testosterone intact has the same survival benefit. And so it's our Do you know, is there a relationship between circulating cancer cells and the end? Yeah. Um, thought to 
possibly be, but not shown. So all the CTC work has done has been castration resistant to show drug activity, but prevention of CTCs, is there any degree of surrogacy with those over survival and localized relaxing? No. PSA is pretty much the same. If you're having circulating tumor cells, you're probably going to have a PSA. Is there a control group in this, or are you just a uh, treat, just standard watching? treatment? Here's the control group, as an example. So this up here, this one's the control group, and this is the new drug, and we're about to launch this study. What about in the in the meta analysis you did in the 1912s? Did you there are different treatments, right? Mm -hmm. So you you lump sum all the treatments as and then sensitivity analysis, whether it was surgery or radiation or length performance, we did yes, that was all done.
also a professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics at Haskell University. He is an associate editor of pharmaceutical statistics and a past associate editor of biometrics. He has over 100 published articles and is the co-author of several books, including The Evaluation of Surrogate Endpoints. So without further ado, welcome to Matt. Hello, thanks for coming. Uh, well, yeah, uh, Chris already introduced some of the concepts, so I will try to describe them, let's say, from a self point of view. I will not perhaps go into much detail regarding these, these uh, curves, how Chris got them, but uh, I'll try to, to convey how this thinking about surrogate endpoints uh, has developed, uh, has developed and, and what are the important points and indeed where are the difficulties. So, well, disclaimer, I have no conflicts of interest in this. I will discuss uh, uh, examples that have been published, so um, if you want, you can, you can also uh, consult them. There's not a continuation about this presentation. Well, uh, Mike already mentioned these are two books. One is an old one. This is when we wrote it, uh, well, let's say only 14 years ago. And now there is a new one where uh, we have more information also, including software and, and stuff. So uh, anything what I'll be referring to, uh, references are also there, so if anyone is interested in then consult this one and then if they want all the information uh, which I refer to is also a lot of information there. So well, I'll start with terminology. Uh, I'll be I'll be talking about clinical endpoints and I'll be no, denoting this by T as uh, as stands for true endpoint let's say. And this is a characteristic of variable that describes how the patient feels, functions or survives. So it's really like capturing uh, you know so say so the patient we, of course, we have biomarkers, so like biological signals, which can be related to normal pathogenic processes, and, and well, there's a plethora of them, of course, in oncology now. And then you have a surrogate endpoint. So it's a biomarker or an endpoint that is instead, instead, intended to substitute for a clinical endpoint. For a true clinical endpoint increases example into survival, right? And the question is, okay, so if you want to substitute this uh, uh, clinical endpoint by, by a surrogate, right? I mean, how do you do this? Because you cannot just say, oh, I will do this, I will use that, and, and, and this will work, right? Because I mean, the question is, what, what will you require? And there was a long, uh, long thinking about uh, regarding what conditions are required for, for a biomarker or an endpoint to become a surrogate. But one thing which is clear now, and this was a mistake made a lot of years ago, was that people were thinking like, oh, it's enough that you know, a potential candidate surrogate is correlated so like, you know, if you have, uh, if you respond to the treatment, so if you have two more things, you will live longer, that's good enough because the treatment effect and response will predict the effect of survival. It's wrong, okay? It's not only wrong in oncology, but also in cardiovascular disease and so on. And that, that, that was made the, over the years ago, and this was this famous uh, article, which actually stalled the, the, the development of surrogacy because, I mean, this was a like, you know, forbidden concept. And you can see it very clearly, like for instance, this is a case where you have two groups, let's say uh, this is the control group and, and treated group on the surrogate and true endpoint scale. So you see there's a correlation within each treatment group between the surrogate and, uh, and the true endpoint or clinical endpoint. But there is an effect, there's a difference, let's say mean difference between the two groups on the surrogate scale, but there's absolutely no difference in terms of the means in these observations on this scale. So there's a treatment effect on, on the surrogate and no treatment effect on the true end, on the clinical endpoint. Or vice versa, if you have a situation, and perhaps biologically this, this is actually a little bit less appealing or clinically, there's no correlation between the surrogate and true end for, for individual patients. But if you look across the groups, there is a difference, mean difference on the surrogate scale, and there's a mean difference on the clinical endpoint scale, right? So in theory, you might have a surrogate which might actually be well, unassociated, if you look at individual patients, uh, you know, with a clinical endpoint, but the treatment effects, so the, the, the group level, uh, let's say, characteristics may be correlated with each other, okay? Now, uh, this is, I haven't seen an example of this, uh, but there's a lot of unfortunate examples like that, right? So, so the question is, okay, fine, so if, if not a correlation, right, uh, what? I mean, what would you need, require from, from a candidate surrogate uh, to, to accept? And this is a, a remarkable paper, so it was actually presented, published by Ross President's Press as a, as a commentary to another paper. And 
what Francis proposed was, well, let, let us specify that a test of no hypothesis of no effect of treatment on surrogate should be equivalent to a test of no hypothesis of no treatment of uh, effect on the clinical endpoint. So the idea is it shouldn't matter whether you do the test uh, of efficacy for the surrogate or clinical endpoint, they should give you the same result, okay? Now, that's a nice idea because this essentially means that you run a trial on the surrogate, you just do the test, and if it's non significant, then it would mean that for the clinical endpoint, it would also be non significant, right? The challenge with this is that this is impossible to check in practice. Why? Because you cannot check what happens under the null hypothesis. You, in practice, we never prove the null hypothesis, right? We always reject this, right? So if we are in a situation where our, our drug doesn't work, right? I mean, you cannot really check whether, I mean, uh, under the null hypothesis, whether whether you have a surrogate or not, okay? Now, Francis proposed to realize this problem and proposed to, uh, you know, uh, alleviate it by, by, by using some criteria. Unfortunately, it's, it's no good. I mean, one of the criteria which Francis proposed is actually going back to the same uh, thing. I mean, the criterion would only be fulfilled if you prove the null hypothesis, and you cannot do this, even with, I mean, unless you have infinite sample sets, right? So, so despite the fact that, that uh, Francis tried to amend the situation, it, it, except for two binary endpoints, which is a uh, very specific situation, you cannot do this, right? So you cannot overcome this issue about proving the null hypothesis, okay? All right, fine, so then the question was, so what, what, what else? So, Friedman, Grobar, and Stratsky, they proposed to say, okay, forget about this testing of null hypothesis, maybe we should, you should just look at the treatment effect, okay? Why don't we say, why don't we look at the treatment effect and see that if we actually take into account information about the surrogate, whether the treatment effect disappears, which would mean that actually the treatment effect is fully captured by the surrogate. This is coming from this mediation analysis uh, work, right? The idea is that here you have your treatment, here you have your surrogate endpoint, this is your clinical endpoint, and you could have like direct effect of the treatment on the clinical endpoint and indirect, which goes only through the surrogate, right? And in the world of, of well, in, of, in this concept, you should really have only the indirect effect. There should be no direct effect of treatment on the clinical endpoint, right? So the idea is that, like in mediation analysis, is that everything what treatment does on the true and or clinical endpoint should be going via the surrogate, right? And that was the concept. So the idea was then to try to check it and see, all right, is it really so that there's nothing which is left unexplained uh, with regard to the treatment effect on the clinical endpoint if you condition on the surrogate, right? And so it's, if some of you know the mediation analysis type of approach, this is really like looking at the, at the direct and indirect effects, right? And again, it appears that it's difficult to show in practice because what happens is that, you know, it, these, these effects are not very precisely estimated. And in fact, if you look at this measure which tries to capture this, uh, this uh, concept of so this proportion of treatment effect which is explained by the surrogate, in fact, it's mathematically ill-defined. In fact, it appears that it's not a proportion at all. It can be negative, it can be over one. So it's very difficult to interpret that, okay? Now, so it seems that, so the idea was to start sort of like amend this to, again, uh, go away from this null hypothesis situation which was, which was linked in with the Francis definition and try to look at whether the treatment effect is really like, uh, uh, like explained by the surrogate, but it also, it's also not necessarily very uh, useful. So then, what happened is that actually by investigating the properties of this uh, measure, this proportional treatment effect, uh, Mark Boyce and Kurt Mollenbergs came up with this idea that if you actually look at the proportional treatment effect, you can see that it separates into two quantities. Well, actually into three, but two of them are important. One was uh, related to, uh, to the association between the surrogate and true endpoint, well, if you if you remove the treatment effect of one of the difference of quantities. And the other element was the relative effect. So the relative magnitude of the treatment effect of the clinical endpoint uh, as compared to the effect of the surrogate. So it appears that these two things come together and they form this proportion, this, this measure, okay? And you can see that 
actually what happens is that if you look at the correlation that's or association between the two endpoints, this is related to the question how well the surrogate predicts the clinical endpoint for individual patients, right? I mean, what is the correlation between these two endpoints if you look at individual patient data? And the relative effect, well, you could link it to the prediction of the treatment effect of the clinical endpoint from the effect of the surrogate. And now that's an interesting idea because imagine that you do a trial which uses a surrogate, right? I mean, in a sense, you might not have data on the true endpoint at all. So what you would do in this trial, you could ask the question, okay, if I have an estimate of the treatment of the surrogate, what is my predicted effect on, of treatment on the, on, the, on the true endpoint, right? And that's actually what Chris was referring to, right? You could actually think, all right, if I could predict the treatment effect on the true endpoint from the effect on the surrogate, and if this prediction is good, right, if it's precise, well, then it would be a good surrogate, right? Because, well, by estimating the treatment effect on the surrogate, I could precisely predict the effect of the treatment on the true endpoint, and that's good. So that was actually what, what was like kind of an intermediate step which led to something which is now used uh, uh, all the way. So, in fact, this, this can be explained simply in case, like, imagine that you have two continuous endpoints, like uh, your surrogate and your clinical endpoint are just continuous randomly, uh, uh, continuous normal, uh, normal distributed variables, okay? So, if you look at, these are individual patient data, so these spread between the, uh, for the surrogate and clinical endpoint, you could look at this and you could actually look at the correlation between the points and, you know, this is this idea of correlation between individual measurements for the surrogate true endpoint for the individuals, right? As I said, this is by no means indicating that this is a group of surrogate, but this is what, what, what Chris already mentioned, this is like individual level surrogates. It's a patient level association between the endpoints, right? And if there's a correlation, you could say that it's biologically meaningful. Well, as I said, and that's also perhaps confusing, but I told you that essentially this might be indicative that, well, essentially this is like a, some kind of biologically meaningful association, but it doesn't mean that you can predict anything at the trial, okay? Because you can get no effect on one, on surrogate, without, a, uh, without with an effect on true and from the vice versa. So what you need is to really have the association between treatment effects. Now, the problem with this approach is that Mark and Penker consider just a single trial. And basically in a single trial, you can just one point. This is your treatment effect on the surrogate and on the, your true endpoint, and you have just this one point. Now, you could actually build a prediction model based on this. How? Because you could say, well, assume that we have a regression going through the origin, right? So if you have no treatment effect on the surrogate, you shouldn't have an effect of treatment on the true endpoint, right? Then you could actually have an association, a linear model, and you could actually estimate the slope of this model based on this one point, and that would be exactly the relative effect. That was what was proposed by in this, in this publication. So now, if you could estimate this relative effect precisely, then you could have a prediction model for your true treatment effect, effect, uh, effect of treatment on your true endpoint, precise prediction, and then you would have your prediction model. Now, the obvious problem here is that there's this regression through the original assumption, right? In principle, for any surrogate you would expect it, right? I mean, why all of a sudden if you have no effect on the surrogate, you would have some effect on the true endpoint. That would be nonsensical. But obviously this is an assumption which in this situation you cannot test, right? But you could test it if you had more than one point, right? And that's eventually what happened. So what happened is that after this research, these ideas of individual level association and trial level association actually pro pushed forward in the context of meta-analysis. And that's why Chris was talking about the meta-analysis, right? Because to look at the individual level association, you can do this in one single trial. You just have like, a, I don't know, 100 patients, you measure the surrogate on and clinical endpoint, you do correlation analysis, that's it, right? But if you have like 20 trials, you can also have points here, and you can actually estimate this regression, and you no longer assume that it has to go to the to the origin, in fact, you can check it, right? So that's actually how this thing evolved. So this idea about that an endpoint can be used as a surrogate if it predicts the clinical endpoint for individual patient and it allows 
rely on the prediction of the effect of treatment on the clinical endpoint, right? This was actually adopted as the, let's say, the methodology which is currently uh, used in practice. So the validation nowadays is based on precision of the prediction. The effect of the treatment on the surrogate endpoint must be reasonably likely to predict the clinical end, uh, effect, right? Then, and so this is really very much linked to the trial level. And in fact, this is what you have seen already. Then you look at your meta-analysis, you look at the points which correspond to your treatment effects on the surrogate and two endpoint across different trials, and look, and you look how close they are associated, right? So in terms of the linear regression, you could look at R squared, so collection of determination. <coughs> and lastly, if R squared is close to one, your precision is very your precision of your prediction is high, you have little residual variability left, so your surrogate is good. If R squared is close to zero, it's no good, right? You could, of course, replace this by, by looking at the correlation instead of, of, the, of the patient of determination and the conclusion is the same. So that's it. Can that evolve further when you include real world evidence? Is that the big push? Well, the, 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 the issue with real world evidence I have is that, well, what is guaranteed here is that you have unbiased treatment effect estimates, right? With real world evidence, you could do, but you have then issues which are related like to multiple meta regression and the, the issues, right? Like ecological fallacy, right? Because you would need to really correct for the possible differences between, you know, different sources of your real evidence data. And that, that's a challenge, okay? I mean, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it would mean that, that you might need to go to more stretch with respect to additional variables, auxiliary variables, which you would have to, to plug in, in your modeling exercise, okay? At least in clinical trials, these points are like unbiased estimates of your future. Okay. Are you saying that, that if this is required, that the surrogate is required for the disease to occur? Require, I mean, if you want to, to claim that something is a surrogate, right? Well, yes, in principle, in the, within, this, within this framework, yes, right? If I understand you correctly. So that means that every patient would have to have a surrogate? Every, every patient would have, well, yeah, I mean, but uh, mind you, this is historical data. Right? So in a sense, uh, what, what happens is that you can only, in a sense, uh, say whether something is surrogate or not based on what has been done in the past, right? I mean, it's, if you have a novel situation, completely novel situation, like, for instance, completely new, new treatment mechanism, for instance, right? It's very difficult to then say whether whatever you've done in the past is relevant for your current situation, right? And then it means that you you might not be in a good situation to use a surrogate, right? Or, or claim that something is surrogate because you don't know how the treatment effects will behave on this completely new treatment mechanism, right? But in order, in this, in this respect, yes, in, in principle, it means that in your historical data, you have to have patients who have both endpoints observed and, you know, they were treated. Question? Yeah. Oh, okay, did I explain it? Yeah. Um, it, it has to do with, with the model you put up for where the uh, surrogate was an intermediate between the between the uh, you know the, 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 the true endpoint, right? Well, that, that model, this 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 mediation model, is really very much linked to this framework of the proportional treatment effect, right? right? Here, it's no longer because here you separate the individual level with the trial level, right? right. So it means that that at the at the individual level, in a sense. Your correlation can still be like a kind of, a, well, you could th still think that there may be like a kind of a association which is caused some by some mediation or whatever, right? But at the trial level, this is orthogonal, at least in, the, in, in, in this case where we consider linear models, right? It's orthogonal to the individual level. So this, this mediation concept is not necessarily there. Okay. So my, my question goes to the point, it, it's very satisfying when the surrogate feels like an intermediate. Right? Yes. Yeah, so the, but the truth is, in some sense, an adverse event could be a surrogate. True. It's entirely possible that the development of hypertension is every bit as predictable as a partial response. It is possible. It has been actually observed, right? I mean, I always forget the name of this of this therapy, the target therapy, but what a surrogate endpoint is whether there's a rash. I developed that, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> you know better than myself, right? <laughs> and that's exactly the point. Well, you know, <laughs> That, that that was only even tested because the statistician asked me for a negative control uh -huh. for the presence of the receptor on the cells. So okay. We fully expected the presence of the receptor to be predicted, it wasn't. Yeah. Well, yeah, but well, we needed a negative control, so I said, 
use the wrench. Yeah, but, but the thing, well, yeah, but the thing is that I indeed, I mean, it's a, it's a nice example, right? I mean, well, to me, it's one of the examples where, where you, you could say that it doesn't have to be endpoint, but the clinical endpoint. It can be sort of like it's going into the direct biomarker. It would be perfect if the receptor was actually right. behind it because we would have clearly the biomarker. Like, say, this rash is sort of like a little bit more complex than the biomarker, but it's not, it's, it's a, it has a clinical symptom uh, meaning, but it's not necessarily perhaps, uh, you know, full clinical endpoint. We ever imagine a regulatory agency accepting that kind of a well, I mean, I'm, I'm having a problem with magic anything about regulatory agencies. <laughs> <laughs> I would think that'd be really tough, though. Unless, unless it's really very, very specific. Well, okay, uh, that, that's possible. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I mean, but uh, mind you, I mean, it may, well, we are in situations now that, that you know, in particular diseases, uh, you know, there's a lot of things taken into account, like the context of the disease, rarity, and stuff like this, so it may have. Yeah? Um, what's the minimum number of Forget about these questions. There's nothing like that. But if yeah. I have only two trials, it's a perfect Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, if you have two trials, I mean, there is, it's a new point to do linear regression, right? So I, I would say, okay, minimum number is more than two, okay? <laughs> if you want to have at least some some precision, right? But but it's, well, my point is usually are li you are limited to what you got, right? So so that's the point. And, and, and the only way which I can, I mean, you cannot, it's also like with a meta-analysis, with a meta-analysis, it's like you don't plan meta-analysis, right? Because you have nothing like sample size calculation for meta-analysis. Meta-analysis are done what you have done in the past, right? So I think these questions about how many trials you need to include is not really something I can plan. I have to go to back there. And the only thing which we can do, and this is what Chris tried to do, is you can try to plot the prediction limits around your regression line, okay? And see if they are precise enough or not. This is, uh, by the way, you know, linked to this SPE idea, right? So if your prediction limits are really wide, it means that, you know, taking into account the amount of data you've got and the, you know, the number of trials you have and the precision of your estimation of your regression model, okay? Your prediction limits are still too wide to have a precise prediction for the treatment effect on the two endpoint, and it means it's not a good surrogate yet. I mean, at least from the practical point. I mean, theoretically, it might be very good because if you knew the, if you knew exactly the regression and there would be very little, uh, very little variability on this regression, this might be perfect surrogate. But if you have few points to estimate this uh, association, it may not be at this moment with these trials still clear that there's a s strong association or not. Okay. So the other question I have is about universality. In other words. Is it true necessarily that every that a surrogate will work for every class of drug? And the example on the high right. No, no, you are right. That's another issue, right? Of course, I already mentioned that. It's like if you come with a completely treatment with a completely new mechanism, right? I mean, it may not necessarily be. Or I mean, your example of rash is perfect, right? I mean, you take another drug which doesn't have any local reaction on the skin, and you cannot have this because for for, for the control or for the treatment group, there's nothing like this. What I, what I was actually thinking of is in adrenal cell cancer, um, for, for some time, progression-free survival was proven to be a surrogate for overall survival yeah. for the, the things like the, the receptor, the TKI, the beta receptor yeah. TKI. Yeah. And for, it just turned out that it is not a reliable predictor for the checkpoint here. Yeah, that's true. But it also changes right from, from the metastatic disease to local disease. Yeah. Right? If you have also the cases where, where in, in, in uh, let's say, uh, adjuvant co context, well, you have a surrogate, but in the advanced context, you don't. I mean, in, we, we done the analysis on the stomach cancer, uh, uh, stomach cancer uh, uh, treatments, and it's clear that you don't, you have a surrogate sit in the adjuvant set setting, but not in the metastatic setting. Uh, so related to adjuvant yeah. question just now, because typically the challenge with this meta-analytic Well, I mean, it's a natural idea, 
We've done this in the past. I, myself, I'm not necessarily fond of that. Well, because the, the issue I have is that, well, the trials, I mean, the, the source of heterogeneity may be different if you get different groups in the trials. So let's say if you split your trial by regions, right? I mean, the, the within region patients are maybe different populations. And you might, for instance, say that your surrogate is good in, let's say, patients with, uh, without a mutation. It's not good when you have heavy mutation where no treatment works. Okay? And if you start to split the, the trials by regions, in a sense, you may actually, uh, you, you start to go into this direction. So it would be rather more meaningful to meet in terms of like trying to see uh, like, so the, the, the natural thing would be to say, okay, I have subpopulation of the patients which have some particular profile and then see how surrogacy looks like this, right? And when, when one starts to do this per region or even per center split, I mean, I think you start to mix this this issue, uh, you know, like almost like surrogacy in well-defined population and other well-defined population and put one regression. So I, I have a problem with that. But I, I agree that people sometimes do this, and we've done this in the past. I mean, by we, I mean me and my colleagues when we were asked to do this because there was no other way. But I'm, I'm skeptical myself about that. That's another question. Yeah, one more quick question. So the Well, I mean, yeah, well, in such a situation, right, I mean, the, well, my point is as follows. Assume that you've got the model, right, and you've got the validated surrogate, right? I mean, it does allow you to predict your treatment effect, well, according to the model, but you have to come up with this treatment effect on the surrogate, right? So if you are able somehow argue that your non-controlled trial, right, uh, leaves, <coughs> gives you a good idea about this, this effect on your... On, on the surrogate, you could use the model to predict the effect on, on the true handcuff, right? But then you would have to defend your proposed estimate for, on the treatment effect on the surrogate. Uh, well, I've got two examples, right? I mean, so, well, perhaps you can also see uh, how they work. So, so just to wrap up, so this is where we are in this moment. Uh, there's also, I, I'm not going to talk about this, but there's also a lot of research now going on about the causal uh, treatment effects and they may be helpful in situations where you don't, you don't have meta-analysis. I'm not talking about that, that's a new research. But that's an established methodology. So meta-analytic approach, as you saw, done by Chris, is something which also FDA used, okay? So essentially you, you need, like, a, if you want to assess the two levels, individual level and trial level, you need to have, well, in principle, you, you may use a two-stage model. First, you need a joint model for individual observations on surrogate and true endpoints. So you take all the patients from all your trials, right, and you use, for instance, you know, for bivariate normal regression, or you use like popular model for survival data, or something like this, which spits out the association estimate for your individual endpoints, like correlation between your endpoints or some <coughs> kind of false ratio, for instance, whatever. And then you estimate from this model the treatment effects, the trial-specific treatment effects on your surrogate and true endpoints. And then on the second stage, you use just this linear model between the treatment effect estimates and you look at the R squared, right? And basically, the higher the R squared, the better, okay? There are some caveats here because you, the, the second level is based on estimated treatment effects, so you should correct for that. There are methods for that. I'm not going to do that. So just to let you know, case study with this. So adjuvant setting, HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. The question is, is visual survival good surrogate for over survival? It's a recent thing which we did in, uh, with my colleagues. Uh, patients after resection, uh, eight randomized trial, uh, trials about 14,000 patients, 12 treatment comparisons uh, between these trials because some of these trials were multi-armed, so we sort of like split these trials uh, so that we have independent comparisons. And basically the comparisons were with any anti-HER2 antibody for at least 12 months versus any control. Essentially, the idea was that your experimental was addition of, of well, let's say, these uh, anti her to antibody to whatever the, the <coughs> was with comparison. So these are the trials. Uh, well, as you can see, well, they differed somehow in the, in the follow-up. These are number of, uh, of, of patients. Uh, and as you can see, 
that some of them were uh, multi-armed, uh, and usually you have this this addition of uh, trastuzumab, for instance, to to the chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy or either concomitantly or, or sequentially. But there was a clear uh, split between like regimens which were based on uh, uh, anti-HER2 uh, agent and, and without. So if you look at the individual level, it's not purely that, but well, what you can see is that you see that well, you know, the blue thing is the the control group, the, the red thing is the experimental group, and you have OS, which is uh, which is uh, uh, the dashed line and and uh, the, the solid line with DFS. So what you could say is okay, uh, well, if we we, look, we see that for instance there is an association because uh, you know compared to the uh, like within the control group, if you look at the blue curves, right? So you have some difference uh, between the OS and the EFS, and if you look at the uh, experimental group, red, red curves, you, you, have, you see you also have this, this effect, which is like sort of like shifted here. So it seems that EFS and OS goes hand in hand for the patient, and in fact, when you use an analysis, and this is based on cochlear model, you can estimate this correlation between EFS and OS for individual patients to be like 90%. So pretty tight association, it's pretty obvious, the, the longer patient survives without, without the disease, the longer the patient survives overall, okay? That's what it says. So this is the individual level. So let's say DFS and OS is a, DFS is a surrogate at the individual level, but the question is whether it's a surrogate at the trial level. Can you predict the treatment? And these are the treatment effects. So these, the size of the circles correspond to the, the, to the, the sample size of these comparisons. As you see, this is the regression line. And you may see that it's a pretty tight association around this regression. In fact, if you look at the R squared, it's about 0 0.84, which means that in terms of correlation, it's nine, over 90% correlation between these treatment effects, okay? And, and essentially, if you look at the regression line, this is the intercept, so it's very close to zero. So on the hazard pressure scale, this is the origin. So indeed, it's a regression to the origin. And you see that it's about like, in terms of the logarithm of the hazard pressure, so the reduction, let's say in DFS, is about 9% uh, smaller effect in terms of the reduction of OS, than the so effect on DFS is slightly larger than on OS, right? But they go very much hand in hand, right? So this is an example where you have individual and trial level surrogates, right? If you would uh, do here uh, prediction limits, you could see that you could relatively uh, uh, precisely predict the uh, treatment effect uh, on the on overall survival from the effect on DFS, right? What does it, well, what we did is we looked at actually at three trials which were published but were not included in this meta-analysis. So these are the three trials. This is the hazard ratio observed in these trials. This is the, for DFS. This is the hazard ratio for OS which was observed. And this is the one predicted from the model with the prediction interval. So as you can see, here we are very close to each other, here as well. There's a little bit of attenuation of the predicted effect here, but confidence interval is actually including this value. And you see, if you look at the conclusions, well, essentially the, the, the difference is that here, uh, observed hazard ratio seems to be insignificant here, the prediction interval would mean there's no significant, right? But in terms of the prediction, this model seems to give you a good idea of what the true treatment effect might be. And what does bio, well, as Chris was saying, it gives you time, right? If you look, for instance, at, you know, at this OS curve for the experimental group, you know, like 80%, 80% uh, survival here, about uh, like uh, six uh, years, right? And here, the same level observed uh, on, 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 so this is DFS and on OS, the same, uh, well, at this level, it's, it becomes like uh, 90 months further, right? So there's a delay in observing let's say, the, the, the survival curves, right? So it means that you could gain time, right? And that's the main major bonus. And that's what Chris tried to adamantly, you know, uh, argue. So the second case study is perhaps uh, quickly to finish up. This is the famous or infamous FDA-based analysis for a new adjuvant setting, pathological complete response as a surrogate for even free survival and over survival for patients with early breast cancer, okay? So what they did is to 12,000 patients from 12 trials, and they compared any neoadjuvant treatment versus no neoadjuvant treatment. And they looked at the 
these curves for the for the inventory survival for uh, non PCR PCR and the fatal pressure is fifty percent. So there's an association, right? So individually, yes, PCR predicts survival for individual patients. But if you look at the trial uh, at the treatment effects in terms of the odds ratio for pathological complete response and hazard ratio for reduced free survival, there's nothing. R squared equals zero point zero three. So they go all the place. So Individual level surrogacy, yes. Trial level surrogacy, there's nothing. And then you have this. The guidance of FDA for using pathological clinical response, complete response as the surrogate in, in for support accelerated approval. So in fact, they have issued this before this analysis was done. And this analysis actually shows that, that this is not a good surrogate. So it shouldn't be used really. Okay, so now I think there's a challenge. So just to mention these two things. At the individual level, you may have individual services association between two endpoints. It's fine. For patient management, it may be interesting because you know that if you have, if there's no complete response or if there's no response of the tumor, the patient is at the risk of dying, so you should do something about this. But for surrogacy, this is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the trial. Can you predict one treatment from the other, right? And that's essentially useful for assessment of the treatment efficacy and for designing your trial, right? Unfortunately, you need data, right? So we cannot expect to evaluate any surrogate a surrogate with data. That's a, that's a challenge, right? But I mean, there is relaunch apparently, right? But I mean, not in the surrogacy world. I mean, if you don't have much data, it's very difficult to claim that you can actually fall on something to replace your true endpoint because you, you need some empirical evidence. Otherwise, the only evidence would come from complex biological, physiological, whatever discussions regarding the mechanics of the treatment and mechanics of the clinical evidence. But I haven't seen any situation yet where this could be complete enough to understand how the treatment works and therefore how could you argue, you know, pretty, pretty convincingly that this should actually allow you to say something about what will happen in the treatment. What about relapse? Is there data on well, again, relapse. It's, it's, it depends on the on the on the cancer drug, for instance, right? I mean, it's it, it is so that I mean, I think in the cases like uh, like breast cancer, for instance, uh, people do, did look at the relapse, and, and I think this it didn't nothing worked there, right? It's also head and neck cancer. I think there was a meta analysis and and relapse free survival. I, I think in there. I remember, but I think there it was a difference whether you had radiotherapy trials or, or chemotherapy trials. In radiotherapy trials, you had some some success with local regional, let's say, uh, events as surrogates for the, let's say, long-term uh, survival events. But for chemotherapy trials, you had a mechanism that it, it didn't work. So it's very specific for the to the disease, you know, type of the treatment. So what I'm saying is, well, initially people had an idea, oh, if there will be surrogate, it will be, you know, surrogate for the whole disease. No, it doesn't work. Like so there's of course a lot of discussions every time you want to argue for surrogacy because everything comes in the picture, the, the mechanics of the treatment, the disease, previous data, and so on. So most of the time we wouldn't be able to get the patient level data. I'm not sure, well there are hard. initiatives to share the patient okay. data, right? But suppose that I, I got trial level data yeah. using the published yeah. data. And I observed some R squares, yeah. very good, yeah. 80%, 90%. Yeah. Uh, that could be done. The, the, the trial have you ever seen a situation where you see the trial level, 80, 90% R squared, but when checking the individual patient data, it's screwed up? Well, no, no I haven't seen, seen that. The, the, the challenge with the trial level data is, let me put it this way, the issue with the trial level analysis only is that, that as I said, you have estimated treatment effects, right? So there's an estimation error, which is hidden in these points, right? And you are after the true treatment effects, right? So the point is that there are, well, you should correct your analysis for this estimation error. And in fact, it's not only the precision which is important. So it's not only standard, uh, uh, standard errors of your treatment effect estimates, which usually you can squeeze out from, your, yeah. from the publication. But the issue is about the correlation between the standard, between the estimation errors, right? Because you are after correlation between the treatment effect on the, let's say on PFS and OS, right? There is also estimation error, which comes, well, it's most likely, most likely used, well, it involves individual association. 
And that means that you would have to have the correlation within the trial correlation estimated for the for this and reported for these two treatment effects which they give you in the publication. And usually you don't have it. And if you don't have it, you cannot do the full uh, adjustment for the association right, between the estimated treatment effects. And this is the challenge, okay? So there may be bias there, and there can be some work which were quantifying this bias, but it's, but it's you know, it is there, right? So one could do so, which I call something like naive analysis, right, of this uh, association from summary published data, where you just take the linear regression for the estimated treatment effects and so on, and you could say, well, you could even weigh these points by the sample size, right? But the issue is that to do meaningful adjusted analysis, you would have to correct also for the within trial correlation, and this is usually not available in your in your publication data, and that's what's available if you do the individual patient. So that's 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 the pitfall with the trial level only analysis. Although there's a paper by Corm uh, and, and someone in statistics medicine where they argue that well. It's not much bias. They argue that the correlation actually doesn't bias this result that much. But obviously, it depends on the amount of the correlation, the tightness of your association. So, I mean, based on simulations, they claim that. But I mean, in the practical situation, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that there's no problem whatsoever. 